Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, as you can see, we're doing a good job with social distancing and masks. We want to keep that up throughout the meeting uh, and stay safe. And the other thing we'll do is we'll move along quickly so we don't prolong the uh, gathering. First, this, let us stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I've been advised by the town clerk that the warrant has been pro properly served. I would entertain a motion to dismiss with the formal reading of the warrant. Second, all those in favor say aye. Aye. It's the unanimous vote will dispense with the reading of the warrant. Uh, the clerk, or next I would ask for a vote approving the appointment of Peter Toppin, who we have um, nominated as assistant moderator for this meeting, and uh, I would ask admission to confirm that appointment. Moved. Second. Comes to a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Unanimous vote. You're in, Peter. Okay, the tellers have been sworn in by the town clerk in advance of the meeting. Um, at this point, well, we'll move to the next thing. I'm going to ask Mike Westort, who's the vice chair of the advisory committee, to introduce the members of, the, of his committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, got a short staff today for different reasons, but at the end we have Missy Seidel, we have Dan McQuiggan, Linda Ferguson, Jamie Gilmore, and myself, Michael Westort. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, I, <laughs> next I would ask the chair of the Board of Selectmen to introduce her board. Hi, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Karen Canfield, Chair of the Board of Selectmen. Um, to my right is our Finance Director, Nancy Holt. Sorry, Finance Director, Nancy Holt. Hovering in the back, Town Administrator, Jim Bedreau. Vice Chair, Tony Vignani. Clerk, uh, Karen Connolly. Mara Curran, Andrew Goodrich, and our Town Council, um, um, Cindy Amara. <laughs> Sorry, blank there. Before I go, may I just say one? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Right. I just before I know we have a small group and we're going to be in and out of here because we're not going to have a lot of speeches. But I wanted to just on the half of the board and the rest of the town is to thank all of our employees who've been working so hard throughout the pandemic to conduct town business. They've gone above and beyond, not just the Board of Health, which have been extraordinary, but everyone um, in our department. So we wanted to say that. And I also wanted to bow down to Madam Clerk, uh, Kathy Gardner and her staff. Heather and Ann, who are in the back, for the extraordinary work they did during the election. We had an 80, over 86% turnout. So. <laughs> and, and, fine, and of course, to the moderator for putting together a town meeting during a pandemic, not once, but twice. And the only last thing I want to say is we haven't properly, as a community, welcomed our superintendent. Uh, Mr. William Burkhead, who you'll hear from in a second, so I wanted to welcome him. Yay! <laughs> and we also, because we've all been away from each other, haven't properly congratulated our new Chief of Police, Mark Thompson, and Deputy Chief um, Severman, who are both here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Next, we have a number of employees and town officials who have passed since we've last been together. I'd like to take a minute to remember them. The names of Virginia Heffernan. She was a town librarian, director of the Library and Council on Aging. Marsha Foley, a school bus driver. Alice Beal, a library assistant. John Murphy, coach at Situate Schools. He was also a founding member of the Situate Recreation Commission. And Brad Wheatley, who was on the Community Preservation Committee, the Housing Authority, 
and elections. Let's take a minute to uh, mem memorialize those folks, please. Thank you. Uh, I see that our representative in the House of Representatives in the United States is here with us. Representative Lynch uh, has been good enough to come to not only this meeting, but all of our meetings since he's been, uh, we've been in his district. Uh, I think he'd like to say a few words, uh, if you could, Congressman Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, wonderful to join you. Uh, normally, we're in session on Monday nights in Washington, but uh, we'll be, be back down tomorrow. Uh, I did receive a lot of calls to our office regarding the MBTA's recent announcement of, uh, of cuts to services. Uh, one of those proposals uh, actually contemplates eliminating the ferry service that services uh, Hingham, Situate, Hull, Abington, a lot of the South Shore towns. So uh, I've, I've already had three separate uh, remote Zoom sessions with Steve Poftak, who's the general manager for the MBTA, about this, this proposed funding cut. And, uh, I, I just, and I've had an opportunity to talk with uh, Representative Kearney uh, Representative Moschino and, and, and uh, State Senator uh, Patrick O'Connor. And we are in agreement that uh, we feel that the, the cuts are uh, inadvisable and, and very likely unnecessary given the time frame of federal funding that's already been given in some cases to the MBTA, but also scheduled and, uh, and proposed under other legislation. Uh, to begin with, under the CARES Act uh, that was passed by Congress back in March and April, we actually gave the MBTA close to a billion dollars to maintain services and, and to replace revenue that the T would have received, but not for the, for the, uh, for the pandemic. Uh, in addition to that, we passed the HEROES Act in the House, uh, which provided uh, $1.5 trillion uh, to uh, cover the, again, to provide uh, about a trillion dollars to states and municipal governments and towns to replace, again, revenue that they would have received but for the pandemic. Uh, there's about $600 billion in the revised HEROES Act just for transit funding. And in that, and I, I actually serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and for the first time in many years, we put in uh, $600 billion over five years for, uh, for ferry, uh, passenger ferry grants and another $120 million for ferry construction and terminal improvements with places like Situate, Hingham, Hull in, in mind. Uh, all across the country, uh, we're trying to move people out of their cars and onto ferries. So. Um, <clears throat> As a, as a delegation, we have expressed our opposition to these cuts. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, odd parts of this is that the MBTA has dedicated funding for, fer for the ferry uh, for the months of December, January, and February. So they maintain the ferry funding for those months, yet they cut it for May, June and July, when traditionally, you know, ferry ridership uh, peaks during those months. So we're, we're trying to get them to back off. Uh, we've had several successful pieces of legislation that, as I said before, would restore the funding, uh, not only for ferry service, but also, also for commuter rail for the Greenbush Line. Uh, we've put in uh, massive amounts of, of revenue, not only for our area, but across the country to, to help people uh, when we, do, you know, fortunately, we've got good news on two fronts with Moderna and with Pfizer on the, the vaccine, 
But when we do uh, get to a point where we want to encourage people to get back to work and, and kids go back to school, we have to have the infrastructure in place to allow people to do that. Not only transportation, but also childcare uh, for, for families that, you know, have had kids at home and, and they're, they, they'd like to go back to work, but in some cases it's a school district by school, school district decision whether to, whether to send the kids back to school. So in some places, We'll be sending people back to work, but we won't be sending kids back to school at that same moment. So uh, we just want you to know that uh, as a team, uh, the delegation, state delegation and, and federal delegation from, from the town of Situate are working together on this. We think we have reasonable uh, prospects of being successful. And uh, we think that these, these proposed cuts are ill-timed because we think that Help is on the way, and, uh, and and look, we don't think that every single cut is inadvised. Uh, there are opportunities for weekend service and midday service uh, during the week when you know you, you, we definitely want uh, the 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 uh, the eight o'clock commute or the seven o'clock commute to continue as well as uh, runs to occur at the end of the working day. That has to happen. There are some cuts uh, for runs midday that have very low ridership that could be eliminated uh, as well. There's some very, very late runs on, on the ferries and uh, the commuter rail that could be, uh, could be cut without seriously damaging people's ability to, to you know, to, to, to commute uh, if necessary. So uh, we think there are, there's a responsible way to deal with this. Uh, as always, I'm enormously proud to represent the town of Situate in the United States Congress. Uh, you have a great state delegation here as well, uh, Senator O'Connor and uh, Patrick Kearney and Joan Moschino, who have been working with me as well on this. And uh, we, we really appreciate your, your, uh, your patience with this, and we, we pledge to do uh, as much as we can to make sure that we mitigate any, any serious cuts uh, to transportation for the town of Situate. Uh, may God bless you all. Thank you for being involved in town meeting. Uh, may God bless the town of Situate, and may God bless these United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I'll take a couple of minutes now just to run through the process, the procedures that we follow. My name is Jim Toomey. I'm the town moderator. My job is to decide questions of order. Uh, I don't take positions or vote on articles. Um, and let's just go through quickly how the process works. The town has two branches of government, the executive branch represented here today by the selectmen and the school committee. Um, and then there's a legislative branch, and that's us. That's the town meeting. Um, each member here is a citizen legislator. Um, the executive branch, uh, have made requests asking for our approval. And that's what comes to you in the form of the warrant. The warrant defines the questions that need to be decided. And within the four corners of the warrant, uh, it's up to the meeting to approve, disapprove, ask questions uh, as we move forward. Um, this is your meeting. It's not the selectmen's meeting or the school committee's meeting. Uh, one factor that I'd like you to be very much aware of is our advisory committee. By law, on each uh, article before the meeting, we have a citizen advisory committee who are appointed by the moderator, who spend the whole year reviewing the issues that come before this meeting and make a recommendation. In doing that, they conduct careful uh, investigations, they work with the department heads, and the executive branches to understand the issues, to question, and to probe. And their recommendation as a result is they're very knowledgeable. And it's something that you should listen to carefully because it's a very informed decision. And we appreciate the work that they do. It's a lot of work and uh, let's recognize that. <laughs> All right, a little bit about the procedural rules that we have to follow. <clears throat> um, only registered voters who have checked in may vote. We have a section for 
non-voters uh, who uh, generally would not participate in the meeting. Um, at times, a non-voter wishes to speak. Generally, I will assume the consent of the meeting to that. However, if anyone has any objections, uh, they should voice them and let me know, and the meeting as a whole would decide whether or not a non-voter could address the meeting. If you wish to address the meeting, you have to rise to the microphone, you have to identify yourself by your name and address. This courtesy shows respect to those present and helps in keeping the meeting minutes. Speakers representing a board, community group, or a client should make that relationship known as part of their introduction. Uh, if you have a motion to make and you're sponsoring a motion, you make the motion before you, you speak. The motion is what defines the discussion that is going to occur. That motion has to be within the scope of the article that is presented in the warrant, because that warrant is a warning to people when they look at that, uh, the warrant, as to what's going to occur at the meeting and what the limits of what could occur. So we have to stay within the advertised scope um, of, the of the warrant uh, within this meeting today. Um, a sponsor would be allowed five minutes uh, to present their article. Uh, you don't have to use all of the time. And we go, especially in this time of COVID, uh, brevity is the soul of wit. So brevity is a watchword at the moment. Thank you, Congressman Lynch, for delivering the essentials. We appreciate that. Uh, Any time a motion is made, we need to have a second to move forward. No motion is in order until we have a second. Uh, I'd ask you to try and use the center microphone in the center of the gym floor here, um, and I'll attempt to recognize folks as they arrive at the, in the order that they arrive at the microphones. Uh, a speaker must first be recognized by the moderator um, before speaking. Um, someone who is not recognized is not allowed to speak. Uh, each speaker is allowed five minutes on their first round of discussion. Uh, they would be allowed three minutes more on a second round after everyone has had an opportunity to speak to the article and has had their turn. The remarks uh, of speakers have to be directed specifically to the article that is on the floor at the time. Um, we want to keep the discussion to those articles. Uh, we're not in judging, not engage in personal discussion or any kind of attacks on the motives of uh, participants. If you have questions or need information, you can ask those questions through the moderator. Um, we will attempt to get a response from a town official who is here, um, but you should be aware that uh, there is not an exchange and We'll do the best to get the information, but you may not get satisfaction in the question that you're answering. We'll do our best. Uh, if a debate goes on and you, f and you feel that the matter has been thoroughly discussed and any additional discussion would just be repetitive, you can move the question. Uh, this uh, process would bring us to a vote on to whether to stop debate and take a vote on the issue before you. Understand, if you move the question, you're not going to be allowed to get the last minute dig in on the issue that you're presenting. So that's a separate, distinct motion and not one that can be used as a tactic to get the last word in. Um, we should be able to conduct this meeting with voice votes. Uh, if a vote is too close and we need to move to a, uh, a standing vote, obviously we'll be able to do that with the size of the crowd we have here pretty efficiently. Um, the town bylaws allow me to call a two-third vote. Uh, if I make the judgment that a vote is two-thirds and someone wants to question that judgment, seven voters can stand and at that point we will take a hand count of the vote, and that applies not only to a declaration of two-thirds, but any time I make a uh, declaration as to a vote. 
Um, last thing, please shut off your cell phones. Now, with that, we're ready to move to the warrant. And the first item that we're going to take up tonight is something that we've tried in the last three or four town meetings, which is called a consent agenda. And the idea is to take and group articles that are fairly routine, that appear not to generate a lot of controversy, and to vote for them as a group so as to avoid the time it takes to go through article by article. Uh, I am going to read through the articles and what they address. Any member loudly can call hold. If they do that, we will take that article out from the consent agenda and address it separately when we get to it in order. So I'm going to go through now the articles that are proposed to be in the consent agenda. Article 1, which is payment of unpaid bills from a prior year. Article 2, which is budget reconciliations. Article 4, reserve fund transfers. Number 5, retirement of the debt for the high school field. Number 6, rescission of uh, unused borrowing authorizations. Number nine is a local option to allow for, to set up a SPED, Special Education Reserve Fund. Number 10 is local acceptance of a statute that allows uh, no cost dog licenses to persons ages 70 or older. Number 12 authorizes uh, the extension of existing cell tower leases in, by the town. Number 14 is the acceptance of Studley Farm Road as a public way. Number 15 would be to amend our town general bylaws so they'd be general, new, neuter, general gender neutral um, throughout the article. So we'd change the language uh, to make it gender neutral. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, or no one wishing it would. Yes, ma'am. You're going to have to go to the microphone, please. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was lumped in there. Um, a hold you on number. Better identify yourself and where you sorry. your address, please. Julie Burgess, 18 Tanglewood Drive. Go ahead. Um, I would just like to put a hold on 15, which addresses the gender neutral um, language change. Fine. And I'm a little nervous, so you just have to forgive me. Um, if I ask a question, is it directed to you or the Yes, board? it's directed to me, but for right now, we're not going to deal with that. If you want to take 15 out, it's out. We'll then go ahead to 15 in order, and you can speak to, the, to that at that time. So do I wait again to come up to the mic? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we have a consent agenda with all but Article 15, and I think the selectmen have a motion to make on that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the Board of Selectmen has reviewed uh, the consent agenda and has pointed out the number one, unpaid bills, two, rec budget reconciliation, four, transfer of reserves, five, retirement of debt, six rescission of borrowing. Those are um, routine housekeeping articles that we're required to get permission from the town to go ahead and do, but they're basically uh, uh, um, routine financial uh, steps. Number nine and number 10 are both local option articles. The first, number nine, is to improve our financial management by setting up a separate um, SPED reserve fund. And number 10 is, um, gives us one more tool in which we can sort of uh, try to uh, find relief for our seniors in town. And uh, so that's the, uh, the dog license. Number 12 is to give the Board of Selectmen authority to enter into a contract with the cell towers. Um, that's what that um, article will do. Number 14 is to accept a street, a new subdivision, the Studley Farm, Studley Farm 
uh, road acceptance that gets reviewed by our fire and DPW and other departments. Um, and the last we has been removed, which is, we'll get to later, is the gender neutral. So the Board of Selectmen reviewed all of these and agreed 5-0 um, to support these articles. Okay, a actually we need a motion. I, I know you've just... And, just I to, and I have to officially move it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, motion, I move that the town vote to take articles 1, unpaid bills, 2, fiscal 21 budget conciliations, number 4, transfer to reserves, number 5, retirement of debt, number 6, rescission of borrowing authorization, number 9, Local option assistance, uh, SPED reserve fund number 10, local option acceptance, no cost dog licenses to persons over 70 or older. Number 12, cell tower leases. Number 14, acceptance of a public way, Studley Farm Road. Uh, and that they be passed by consent in, order, in accordance with motions shown on the consent agenda distributed this evening. Thank you. We have a motion, a second. We have a second. I'd ask the advisory committee, I understand that you are uh, supporting the consent agenda. Mr. Westoy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the advisory committee supports the consent agenda. Um, some of the articles had different votes, but most of them were unanimous, except for, I think, the cell phone tower, which was five to two. Thanks. Thank you. We're ready now for a vote on the motion from the Board of Selectmen. This requires a nine-tenths vote. I'd ask all those in favor to say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. We will next move to Article 3. Article 3. We have a motion from the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town approve the sum of $450,000 for the purpose of providing kindergarten for the 2020-2021 school year and to find such appropriation, transfer $450,000 from the stabilization fund. Second. Motion is seconded. Tony, you may address the motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Clearly, 2020 is an unusual year, and this is a, kind of an unusual article. I can't remember the last time when we actually funded an operating budget from the stabilization fund. And this year, the school committee is requesting $450,000 to assist in funding our kindergarten program. Due to the COVID crisis, the school department was not able to offer full-time kindergarten program. Therefore, they were not able to charge full-time kindergarten fees that were already included in the fiscal year 2021 budget. However, the resources for the full-time kindergarten program, which is mostly teachers, was needed to offer the robust kindergarten program that we actually are offering to our students. The school committee is requesting this one-time $450,000 subsidy to fund this year's kindergarten program from the town stabilization fund, whose balance is approximately $4.5 million. From an accounting perspective and from the opinion of the Board of Selectmen, this is an extraordinary expense. This did not arise from normal business activities. And there were two other pieces of information that the board took into account when making their decision. The first one is that there is actually a chance that some of these funds could be paid by um, the state, our COVID relief fund from the state. Secondly, um, the current budget was created with a reduced amount of funding from the state. The Financial Forecasting Committee got together when the whole pandemic started and we reduced the money that we expected to get to, from the state considerably which had an impact on both the school budget and the town budget. So far, we haven't seen this huge deduction, although Nancy would tell me, you know, to be conservative because we just don't know what's going to happen. But there is a chance that the reduction that we thought that would have occurred in the state funding may not occur as drastically as we thought. Had that not happened, the school would have gotten two-thirds of the money that, that we didn't cut, and the town would have gotten one-third of the money that we have got and they probably would have been able to pay for this program on their own. Um, 
One other point from that is, if this money does come in, there is an article that we pass at the annual town meeting that says that any excess levy dollars goes back to the stabilization fund. So in fact, if we do get more money than we thought, it's actually going to just replenish the money that, that they're requesting to pay for this program. Um, the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously in support of this motion. Thank you. Recommendation from advisory. I've been told people can't hear what I'm saying with the mouths. So well, take it off for a second. Um, the advisory committee thought it was a pretty easy decision. Uh, you can't really charge parents $3,500 for the kids to go to a full day kindergarten when you actually don't offer a full day kindergarten. Um, so advisory approves this recommendation 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion on, on this article? Seeing no hands, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. It's a unanimous vote. We move now to Article 7, which is the Capital Improvement Plan, Ms. Curran, for the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town raise and appropriate, borrow, or transfer from available funds in the Treasury in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44, Paragraphs 7 and 8, and any other enabling authority, the following sums of money, totaling $1,698,940, for the purpose of funding the following capital project costs. The Hummerock Fire Station for $500, Fire station number one, overhead doors for $70,000. Minot Beach parking lot for $292,000. The septic loan program for $200,000. A permitting system for $141,940. A yard jockey replacement piece of equipment for $120,000. And the reservoir dam project for $375,000. And to fund such appropriation, raise and appropriate $211,940 from the fiscal year 2021 tax levy, transfer $292,000 from the Beach Revolving Fund, transfer $375,000 from Water Enterprise Retained Earnings, and borrow $820,000. And I further move that in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, the premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes thereunder, lest any such premium apply to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes, may be applied to pay project costs, and the amount authorized to be borrowed for each such project shall be reduced by the amount of any such premium so applied. I have a motion. Second. Uh, you may speak to the motion if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. The capital request before you this evening is to address several infrastructure and equipment needs that are necessary to maintain and improve a variety of the assets in our town. I'd like to call your attention to just a few of them. The largest investments are for some much needed repairs at our fire station. Our Hummerock station is in great need of repair and also flood protection. And if passed, these funds will help support to renovate that station. Additionally, we'd be able to repair the fire station overhead doors at the first parish station. We also have been working on raising the reservoir for about five years now. The town has been successful in several grants uh, for the engineering. However, it's been stalled significantly due to not being able to receive grants for the design and permitting. This particular amount you're being asked for is to support the fund to finally put it in the final phase so that we can move forward with increasing the water capacity at our reservoir by about a foot and a half, which will give us about an additional 30 days of supply. I think we can all agree that it's much needed. The permitting system is a new request, um, which is a replacement of technology that exists today, and the current online tool is going to be sundown in June of 2021. So it's necessary for us to appropriate these funds now so that we can go out and upgrade our system. This system um, is what provides you with online permitting, inspections, 
and we also look to extend other licensing applications there. I did review the funding sources previously called out. Um, the majority is, it, is from borrowing, being, some of it being supported by the Transfer Enterprise Fund, um, some of it coming from the Beach Revolving Fund, which are your beach stickers, that would be for the Minot parking lot, and then obviously the Water Enterprise Fund will help support the borrowing for the increase um, of, the, of the reservoir. The board did vote unanimously in support of this article and does recommend approval of this motion. Thank you. I'd ask for a recommendation from advisory, Mr. Westoy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. All right, I'll make it short and sweet. One, I can't, I can't believe nobody's asked what a yard jockey is. Either you guys all did your homework or everybody's scared to ask. Anyways, a yard jockey just moves the trailers around uh, the transfer station. The machine's old, they need to replace it. Pretty simple. Um, DPW, obviously we have water issues. If we could do a study to increase the supply of water for 28 days, I don't think anybody here is going to have an issue with that. Um, the beach parking lot, if you've been to mine, it, it's not the greatest place to park. That's being paid for out of the revolving fund. Um, the only other main one was the fire department, and um, that's come before you guys before. Uh, hoping to get it done this time. And the advisory board approves this article 7-0. Thanks. Thank you. And I believe we have a, a favorable recommendation from the Capital Planning Committee on this. Uh, so we have that noted for the minutes of the, rec, uh, of the meeting. Um, is there any discussion on this article? Sir. Hi, P uh, Peter Noyes, 35 Cliff Road South, Hammer Rock. Um, I would ask that the advisory board explain their recommendations or that, that the members here of the legislative body review what it explains here is that the um, you know, Senate says very clear, if the bids exceed this amount, the project will be halted and revised. The bids were opened. Um, the, the Board of Selectmen is well aware of that. And um, I'd like to know what we're actually voting for if, um, if the funding is inadequate to do the fire station number four in Hamarok. Thank you. For the advisory committee. Yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, the way this is written, it's appropriate to the article. The funding, even though some of the bids or the bid has come in, the bid has not been fully reviewed yet. yet. I'm sure our town administrator will answer to that. But you have to give the town the opportunity to review the bid and also seek other sources of funding if, in fact, this is short. It could be that the town can perform certain tasks within their own budgets that would offset some of the overrun in your existing bid system. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, gentleman at the mic over on my left. Uh, Scott Greenbaum, 40 Damon Road. I have two questions. First question has to do with the reservoir rising, raising the level of the reservoir. I read the article and it says 28 winter days, which I think we're running about 500,000 gallons per day. And over the summer, we ran 200,000. So it's, t only, it's six and a half days in the summertime of capacity. Is that correct? We have someone who can respond to that question. Uh, DPW director. Scott, it is, it is a little misleading, sorry about that. It's, I believe it's a million gallons per day is what they use to get the 28-day capacity. So right. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we understood what we're voting for, that this is not going to solve the issue in the summertime 
of having to have water restrictions. This is only going to be part of a program to get there. Yep, and that's why we're looking at Dolan well fields and other, other options too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Question number two. Yeah, is there any description of what they're going to do to the parking lots at Minot Beach? Because from my understanding, they're in flood zones and there's very little that you're allowed to do there. I know that the, when I was in the Conservation Commission, there was, it was brought to us, they wanted to pave the second parking lot on the other side of the inlet where they just did the uh, little bridge and they wanted to pave the existing one and expand it and everything was in a flood zone and a uh, resource area so there was not much that they could do and, and so does anybody have any explanation of what the existing what the new plan is right now our dpw director can answer that question so scott again this is for repaving the existing we call it parking lot one and parking lot two we're not touching parking lot two Parking lot one expands it. It adds drainage as well as a storm scepter. Some other different stuff around there. It's already gone through conservation at one point for design approval. Um, and does that answer your question? It does raise it up a bit. And there also is some curbing around there to help prevent it from flooding out like it does every time we get a tide over 10.5. And then, so that's not expanding it. It's just in the same footprint. It expands it a bit because there's some land area over there towards the houses that's town land that is actually paved and incorporated into the parking lot, but it's uh -huh. preliminary design right now. All right, and then the other parking, the parking lot too, nothing's gonna happen there. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, sorry, parking lot number two, nothing is gonna happen over there then. Correct, correct. Uh -huh. This is just for the paved parking lot. We're losing the back end of it and we're gonna fix it up, repave it, and hopefully get some more spots in there, which probably we will have something, either a public meeting or a selectman's meeting that'll be showing the plans that we have. We had one maybe about three years ago, two years ago, showing that area. That's fine, I just wanted to understand what was going on. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Mr. Noyes. You're going back to the fire station. I was hoping that uh, town meeting members had a minute to read the advisory board recommendation on page 12. Um, I would like to offer an amendment. I appreciate that you said that you're following Robert's rules of order, and I believe you have to um, take the amendment. My amendment is that, um, that the town of Situate fulfill the legal obligation as required by the invitation of bid dated September 30th, 2020, and the bid result of October 30, 2020, by fully funding the article. Okay, and as we've discussed, I, I do have, uh, if you have a written copy of that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have had occasion to discuss this proposed amendment with Mr. Noyes, and unfortunately I have to rule that it is not in order to be voted upon uh, because it is beyond the scope of the article. It would seek more money uh, than what is stated, namely $500,000 for the fire department. Uh, therefore, uh, to consider any higher number than that would be beyond the scope of the article that was sent to residents and uh, it is not in order to be amended. So I reject that amendment. Further discussion? Sir? Yes, uh, I'm Jim Glinski, 30 Hollett Street. Um, I've written two books in the last two years. One is on the history of the fire department and one is on the water supply. So I'll deal with the reservoir issue first. Uh, people have to understand that the reservoir, raising the reservoir uh, a foot and a half is part of a strategic plan. Uh, it's one piece of several uh, projects that the fun town has funded, including uh, the current renovation of well 17A uh, and 18B. Uh, and the reservoir is intended to be a supplemental water supply. Uh, it's usually uh, what the town depends on a lot during the summer. Uh, and 
to raise the, the reservoir would just give us, uh, as part of the strategic plan for the future, uh, a more adequate uh, water supply. And I think all of us are aware we have a pretty fragile water supply. Uh, but it's not just a standalone item, it's part of a strategic plan. Uh, it's also important for the fish. Uh, everybody's familiar with that sign outside of the uh, water department uh, station uh, at the rotary. Uh, and if there's not enough water in the reservoir, the juvenile herring don't get a chance to get back out into the ocean and they don't come back. And it is uh, First Herring Brook uh, that provides the uh, water for the, the reservoir and the whole watershed. Uh, so I would uh, definitely support in uh, passing that item to fund the uh, raising of the reservoir. Thank you. Thank you. The discussion on Article 7. Seeing none, this uh, requires a two-thirds vote because it involves borrowing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. I'm going to declare it a two-thirds vote. Anyone uh, wants to question that vote, seven people can rise and we'll do a count. It's a two-thirds vote. Next article is number eight, which is the community preservation article. Ms. Conley for the Board of Selectmen. Good evening. I move that the town act on recommendations from the Community Preservation Committee to appropriate the sums of money as indicated below. Appropriations for the items below to be appropriate are to be expended first from any existing reserves for the purposes of such item, with any excess sums to be appropriated from community preservation reserves or undesignated funds. All such sums appropriated are further to be expended subject to all terms and conditions of the applications regarding such projects filed with the CPC and the votes of the CPC regarding approval of such items. Number four, $62,550, restoration of historic 1924 fire truck. Five, $9,000, closing costs for the Mordecai Lincoln property. Six, $15,000 for conservation restrictions for the Mordecai Lincoln property. Second. Have a second. Motion is on the floor. All right. Um, I'm going to ask for a recommendation from advisory. Good evening again. Uh, the advisory committee voted unanimous 7 to 0 in support of this article. Uh, basically taking re historic reserve funds to re to restore a 1924 historic fire truck, which did belong to the town, and the 9,000 in closing costs associated with the acquisition of the Mordecai Lincoln property, and 15,000 for conservation restrictions to be uh, listed for the Mordecai Lincoln property. Again, unanimous, seven to zero. Thank you, Mr. Gilmore. Um, do we have anyone here from the Community Preservation Committee? Mr. Dennehy. I'd also like to say the Board of Selectmen voted five to zero in favor of this article. We have the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Yes, the uh, $62,550 uh, $62, is for the restoration of a 1924 fire truck, which is the second motorized fire truck purchased by Situate. It was uh, tracked down by the Situate Antique Fire Engine Restoration Group and uh, purchased for restoration. The intent is to have it available for uh, display and parades in the future once it is restored. The other two items are pretty much administrative for the closing cost and putting restrictions on the Mordecai Lincoln property, which was approved in the town meeting last year. Thank you. This requires a majority vote. Is there any discussion? Lady on my right. Um, 
Jennifer Kuhn, 20 Cary Litchfield Lane. Um, Mr. Moderator, I would ask that we take number one for the historic restoration of the fire truck and table that item tonight and have it come back at a town meeting when we have a substantial amount of residents here that can vote on, on that amount. Okay, I think technically that's a motion to divide the question. Um, and I would need a second for us to consider that. Is there a second? We have a second. Uh, is there more you'd want to say on your motion? This is a motion to divide the question and have a separate uh, separate out the, you say item number one? Yes, um, out of the three items is the first one for $62,550 um, for the preservation of the fire truck. Okay, um, so I, the, the effect of this motion would be not to approve or disapprove that, but to have whether or not we should have a separate vote on item number one. Um, or, well, the restoration of the fire truck is listed in one spot as one and, and then the other is four, but we would take the fire truck out and, and vote on that separately. That's the effect of your motion. Um, can I not table item number one and put it off to the next town meeting? Well, first you've got to vote to separate it from the others. Okay. That's what we're going to consider now. And then people can vote that up and down as a separate item. Okay. So the issue, the motion before the board, the meeting right now, is whether to separate out the question of the fire truck from the two Mordecai Lincoln property questions. Any discussion on that issue? Hearing none, we'll put that to a vote that requires a majority vote. All those in favor of separating the 1924 fire truck from the remainder of the article, please say aye. aye. Okay, we will take a separate vote when it comes time to vote on the fire truck. We'll now move to further discussion on the article as a whole. I'm sorry. All right, let's do that again. I apologize. All right, so we're going to have, this is again on dividing the question. All those in favor of dividing the question, separating out the fire truck, say aye. aye. Those opposed, say no. no. No's have it. We won't divide it. Thank you. Now, we're going to further discussion of the article. Gentleman in the center, Mike. Yes, Jim Galinsky, 30 Hollow Street again. Um, I'm somewhat responsible for finding the fire truck. I was doing research on my book on the history of the fire department and came across a, a, an email that was buried in the town uh, historical society archives from this guy in Westminster who had this fire truck uh, that had situate on the side of it that he had tracked down in Pennsylvania somewhere. So this thing kind of just fell in our lap and it was the second fire truck that the town had. Uh, so it was a unique opportunity. And uh, former Captain Norm Duffy and Bob Quinlan and others uh, actually drove out to Westminster, Massachusetts in beautiful central Massachusetts and uh, saw the truck and it actually started up and this uh, person in Westminster had been working on it but uh, had kind of uh, given up on restoring it and they actually brought it back. Uh, so it's just a unique opportunity for the town uh, to uh, restore some of its, its history. It is the second fire truck, 1924. Uh, the first fire truck tragically uh, had a, an accident uh, where three firemen were killed uh, going to a fire in, in Norwell in December 1924. Uh, there's some thought that this might also be the, that truck, but it is actually kind of a, just a, the same truck bought by the department a year later. So it's a unique opportunity to preserve some history of the town that uh, we kind of stumbled across. So I would definitely support uh, restoring that truck and making it available to, uh, for everybody in the town to uh, remember all the service of the fire department. Uh, it's a, a unique uh, opportunity to honor our history. Thank you. Thank you. Lady on my right, the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Jennifer Kuhn, 
20 Cary Litchfield Lane. Um, does the town actually own the fire truck or is it privately owned? Mr. Denny. It was purchased by the town of Situate. It was purchased by the town of Situate? Yes. Do you know when that happened? In, are you talking about originally? No, up when the gentleman was off um, Fitzgerald. Well, originally it was purchased by the town of Situate and then was situated and is part of this uh, project will be purchased and owned by the town of Situate. So this amount actually includes purchasing it, not just renovating it and fixing it up? Do you know what the purchase price is? So I, I understand um, a few people purchased it individually. No, we, we, we had a question I which was, do you know what the purchase price is? <laughs> it, could someone provide an answer to that question? If not, that's fine. But. Is it so it, 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 it will. It was purchased by the uh, group uh, Situate Antique Fire Engine Restoration Organization and will be transferred to the town of Situate. So the town of Situate will own it when this project is finished. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. So this amount actually includes purchasing it. I was a little bit um, hesitant at spending the amount on a privately owned fire truck. So I would ask that we hold the question. I think that we should hold the fire truck and vote on it at another time. Thank you. We currently don't own it. Any further discussion on Article 8? This requires a majority vote. Ma'am, yes ma'am, the center mic. Okay. Hi, Stephanie Burke, 93 Marion Road. Um, question. Do you have any approximate costs of storage and maintenance once this is restored? Mr. Dennehy? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, once the fire truck is restored, do you have an approximate cost, uh, restored, do you have an approximate cost of the storage costs or where this fire truck will be kept and how often the town of Situate residents will have access to it? I'm not understanding. Uh, where's Jim? Go ahead. Oh, Jim. Uh, uh, right now, we're, there was a plan to have it stored, which uh, has since changed. Uh, the town has committed to finding a place for it and storing it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a cost associated with that, and I don't know, Jim, you have a location for it yet, uh, but they have committed to storing it at a town facility. Okay, and the second, the second part of my question with um, the access to the fire truck via the citizens of Situate who are paying for it, will we be able to see it? Will it be on display? The intention was to have it publicly available so that it could be viewed by the public and then also taken out at different uh, events that the town puts on, parades and things like that. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can motion this, but I know the previous woman asked to hold it in the, for the fact that not all the details in relation to the price are fully disclosed. Um, going into a year where we are going to see so many unforeseen costs and the economy is changing, I'm wondering if it's something that can be pushed until we know the final cost of this project, which would include storage and purchase. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd Ms. like Conley. to, if I may answer the question, um, CPC vets all of these projects in great detail and there are minutes of the meetings available online for you to look at to answer some of those questions. Um, the, the, I know that the application for this particular project was extremely thorough and I would ask that, you know, people look at the applications prior to asking these questions at town meeting so that you know, that you're educated on um, what the application stated. Any further I'll discussion? also say that uh, the original application was for uh, considerably more money and we had asked them to go back 
and reduce the cost on that, which they did uh, considerably. The restoration of an antique uh, vehicle is extremely expensive. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. This is a majority vote from the Community Preservation Fund. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, say no. no. It's a majority vote. Uh, if you question that, seven can stand in and ask for a handle. Thank you. Thank you. We move now to Article 11 which involves the sale of the Council of Aging Building and the Minot Fire Station. Mr. Goodrich for the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town transfer to the Board of Selectmen for the purpose of selling and or leasing and authorize the Board of Selectmen to sell and or lease for a term not to exceed 25 years on such terms and conditions as it deems in the best interests of the town. The, exist, the existing Council on Aging property, as shown on the assessor's map, 50-6-0-A, located at 27 Brook Street, and the former Minot Fire Station property, as shown on assessor's map, 15-3-A-0, located at 9 Mitchell Avenue. And further, to appropriate the proceeds from any sales to reduce the cost of the new senior center authorized in Article 1 of the May 13, 2019 Special Town Meeting and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to perform all actions necessary to carry out the purposes of this article. Second. Motion is seconded. Motion is on the floor. So I'll, I'll try to make this brief. This has in, in essence been litigated for almost over 18, 24 months. And for anything, it's fulfilling a promise, and that's a promise of trying to be as fiscally responsible as possible and making sure that we're using those proceeds to, to help reduce uh, the debt on this, on this property. And the board voted unanimously 5-0 to support the motion. Thank you. We have a recommendation from advisory. Mr. McWigan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Monterey. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward article. Um, we are seeking to give authorization to the selectmen to sell two valuable pieces of property that the town owns that have really reached their end of use for the town. Um, the fire station is located at 9 Mitchell Ave with an assessed value of $724,100. And the old uh, Council on Aging located at 27 Brook Street with an assessed value of $625,400. Uh, obviously these funds will be put to good use for the town and help reduce uh, debt. The advisory committee recommended the approval of this article uh, unanimously, seven to zero. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? The lady to my right at the microphone. Uh, Jennifer Kuhn, 20 Cary Litchfield Lane. Um, I would ask that, let me get my thoughts together for a second, that um, the sale of the 9 Mitchell Avenue, the fire station in Minot, if we could allow or possibly use those funds, not for the current senior center debt, but use that for the $62,550 for the fire truck renovation. So we would sell the Minot and use the money to renovate and restore the fire truck. Well, essentially, you're asking to amend the uh, motion. Correct. I think the difficulty with that is that the fire truck is a community preservation committee project. We only can get a community preservation project um, in front of us at the recommendation of the community preservation committee. It's my understanding of the community from the last discussion that the Community Preservation Committee has recommended that this be done with community preservation funds. So I'm afraid that we could not amend this article um, as suggested. 
Can I make another amendment? May I make another motion to amend. Go ahead. Uh, can we move the sale of the mine at Firehouse to the CPC funds? Make a motion to move and not go to the debt for the senior right. center. I'm trying to keep it within the fire station and the fire So station. your motion to amend would be to change that portion of the current motion, which refers to the proceeds from sales to reducing the cost of the new senior center. And what would your amendment say? The sale of the nine Mitchell Avenue would go to the um, uh, fire department available funds. I don't know what would be an appropriate account. Well, first of all, we need, if it, we need to have this in writing so we're clear on what we're doing. So I'm going to have to ask you, we'll, we'll, take, we'll give you a couple minutes to put this in writing. Okay. Um, and uh, everybody will take a breather if you want to put that in writing. Okay. Thank you. Is that your intention? Yes. Okay. You can do that as quickly as you can. That would be great. Thank you. Um, I withdraw my motion. Thank you. The motion to amend has been withdrawn. Is there further discussion on this article on the sale of the mine at fire station and the Council on Aging building? I see no one at the mics, therefore we'll call for a vote. This requires a two-thirds vote to sell real estate. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. I declare it to be a two-thirds vote. If anyone wants to challenge that, seven voters can stand and will take account. No one standing, it's declared a two-thirds vote. Next, we move to Article 13, which is the uh, article to amend the zoning bylaw, the sign bylaw. I know we still have to vote to postpone. Yeah, I, the, the confusion here is the plan is to postpone this, this article so that further hearings can be held by the planning board, but we need to take a, uh, have a motion and a vote to uh, postpone this. So first I need a motion. Move to Ann Burbine, Chairman, Citrus Planning Board. Move to take this article under advisement and refer it back to the Planning Board. I have a motion. We have a second. Second. Because of time restraint and a mix up by the um, Patriot Ledger, we were unable to have time for a full public hearing on this article. Therefore, it is going to be on the warrant for April. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing no one at the mics, we'll take a vote on this. It requires a majority vote. The motion is to refer this back to the planning board. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Next item is Article 15, which is to change the reference in the town general bylaws from masculine and feminine to neutral terms. We have the chair of the Board of Selectmen. We have a motion. I move that the town amend the town's general bylaws to change all gender-specific pronouns to gender-neutral pronouns in a manner consistent with the examples below, 
Board of Selectmen will become Select Board, Select Men, changes to Select Board Member or Member of the Select Board, Chairman, changes to Chair or the Chairperson, Vice Chair, changes to Vice Chair or, chair or Vice Chairperson, He, She, changes to They, His, Hers, change, changes to Their, Him, Her, changes to Them. We have a second. Have a second. Motion's on the floor. Do uh, you wish to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the, there are 351 towns in our Commonwealth. 292 of these are select boards or selectmen, uh, to, uh, run by selectmen. In 2020, just in January of this year, the Massachusetts Selectmen Association, which has been around a really long time, changed their name to Select Board Association. At least 86 other towns have done this as well. To my thinking, and the board supported this thought, is uh, we're, we're late at, to uh, acknowledging that our terminology has, has not kept up with the times. Um, I will point out, it, 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 we all argued about what should it be. Select Board doesn't roll off the tongue. We're used to saying selectmen. So I would just point out that not too long ago, we referred to our fire safety officers as firemen. And now no one thinks twice about calling them firefighters. The same can be true about mail carriers and police officers. Um, so the board is um, recommending this. Uh, we voted in favor of this in Article 5-0. And I just wanted to point out that this article addresses our bylaws, uh, because we can do that within our town meeting structure. We will also need to revisit this article, uh, this terminology, when we finish our charter review, which is currently underway. That will also require a vote of town meeting. And should that pass <clears throat> um, the charter language change, that will have to go to the state leg legislature for approval, just as they have for 86 other communities. So with that, I urge you to support it. Thank you. We have a recommendation from advisory. Mr. Westwood. Thank you, Mr. Monterey. Um, the advisory approved this Article 7-0, um, basically just going with the times. We felt it's, it's time to change it and make it more equitable for everybody. Thank you. Is there discussion? Lady at the center mic. Julie Burgess, 18 Tanglewood Drive. Um, I didn't write a formal speech here, but just some notes. I feel like you're actually doing a disservice to women. We've fought long and hard to get our place at the table and I appreciate all the women on the board. And when we take out he, she, his, her, we're not only um, disempowering men but disempowering women. And I feel very strongly that our young girls need an example where they see the word woman and see the word she. Um, I was going to address Congressman Lynch, but he left because we refer to Congresswomen with the, with the word woman in it. Um, and when people say selectmen, it's more of a universal, all-inclusive term. It's not to alienate anybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, if, I feel like, if anything, we should be adding she, not taking it away. So it should be a he slash she in the bylaws. I read through the whole bylaws. I actually learned a lot. I skimmed it, but I learned a lot about our town. And there's so many instances where I just believe it becomes a slippery slope. There's so much wording in there. I mean, it's used hundreds of times, he, his. And when you replace it with them in there, sometimes it doesn't even make sense. Um, and I. I just feel like when you, when you go down that slippery slope of redefining words and definitions, you're, you're losing the classical language that we all respect and love. And in your bylaws, you have many other terms and words. As you stated, some have been changed unofficially. 
but where does, where does it end? Where does the slippery slope go where we're not offending somebody? And I understand that we, you're doing this with the intention of being sensitive to, to everyone, but you know, we can take all sorts of examples, harbormen, firemen, workmen's comp is in there. Um, what, what words, you know, at what point does the slippery slope end? So I, I would appreciate girls and women being able to be recognized and maybe make changes where you add he slash she and maybe call, call yourself select women. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work tonight. Gentleman at the mic on my left. Am I allowed to take the mask off while I speak or would you prefer I kept it on? I'd prefer you keep it on. Okay, we'll do that. My name's Atai Halevi, 65 First Parish Road. Uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is that pronouns in the English language have changed throughout history. William Shakespeare used they, them, and on and on. And Shakespeare is considered, I believe, by most people to be the preeminent writer in English language. And so if gender neutral pronouns were good enough for the bard, I believe that we today in 2020 should probably be able to handle it. The second thing I'd like to point out is that selectmen implies that the task is due to one gender, saying a member of the select board actually distinguishes the task from any gender, just like saying police officer rather than policeman implies that anyone who can meet the standards of that job can do the job. There is no reason for gender to be a part of any title of a job that is doable by a person of any gender. It just doesn't make sense. So I'm in favor of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Lady at the center mic. Mary Vaughn Fireman, 124 Front Street. Get up a little closer to the mic for us, please. Mary Vaughn Fireman, 124 Front Street. Thank you. Um, just recently, uh, I was watching the TV show and I heard the pronoun they, and then I heard it again in this amendment. And, um, and I looked it up. I said, uh, what is the new definition of they? So anybody who has an iPhone can look up this definition by just asking that question. And it says, the Merriam-Webster added a new definition of the word they to its dictionary. Declaring the pronoun may be used to refer to a single person whose gender identity is non-binary. They is a liberating pronoun for many non-binary individuals who identify as genders other than male or female. So if you use they inside, you're going to say that everybody is non-binary because it's in the dictionary, it's in Webster's Dictionary. And I think it just adds to more confusion if you use the they. Now that's in the singular form. As a plural form, they is the regular they, but if you say a person, a singular, you, you mean a singular person, and you call them a they, then they are non-binary. So. I think it's just going to add more confusion. I think we ought to table it uh, uh, and talk about it more because, yes, words change. And anybody in this room can look this up on their phone. And, and about the other changes, I really don't, they, they're fine with me. It's the word they, that, and, and then there and them, I, I, I suppose, follow the same thing if you're talking about a singular person. So that's my confusion, objection. Maybe we should think about it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Lady, uh, oh. lady on my right. 
Hi, um, Nikki Sanders, 226 Beaver Dam Road in Situate. Um, when we call um, the select woman, Karen Canfield, you know, a part of the Board of Selectmen, we know that she's not a man. <laughs> we know that singularly she is a woman and identifies as that if we know her. The same with they. There seems to be some confusion over using they, then you're confused if it's everybody or one person and it applies to everybody. We know generally as a population now that non-binary people exist, that the polite thing to do is not to assume when meeting someone who they are. We don't assume that Ms. Canfield is male because we call her a member of the board of select men, but we maybe ask. That's where we are now. That's where the world is. That's where most towns in Massachusetts are. The world has changed and we have to adjust or else we'll be left behind. And we can learn that from our extraordinarily intelligent situate high school students, our extraordinarily intelligent middle school students, and even elementary school students who have no problem whatsoever understanding if their friends or relatives are using different terms. So if our children are adopting this and understanding this as the new way the world is, then we should follow suit and catch up with everyone else. Thank you. Lady to my left at the microphone. Hi, uh, Jackie Thornton, uh, 7 Crescent Ave in Situate. Uh, this is my first town meeting, and I'm here because I'm really excited about this question, and I just want to I just want to speak to, you know, the power of discussing things like this in a community, and and how it can really get a young person excited to get involved. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for having this discussion and for for bringing this for bringing this article forward. And I want to again stress that. Um, the, 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 the pronoun they is not a new thing. This is not a new thing that we use in a singular context. Uh, I serve on a committee that I can't get into details about, but we don't know any of the people that are applying for a job that we're trying to deliberate on. We don't know if they are a man, a woman, if they identify as something else. All we have is an application in front of us, and the whole point is that we don't, you know, find them on the internet, have any bias about who this person is, and when we're talking about them in our, meeting, in our committee meetings, it's super easy to just say they because we don't know who this person is because we're not allowed to know anything about their gender. So I just want to use that as an example about how in everyday life it's really easy to default to using they to talk about someone when you, when you might not know who that person is going to who that person is, what kind of role they're going to fill, and you know, we don't want to, like um, I think what someone else said before, we don't want to make assumptions about who can do this job based on what that person's gender is. And I think it's a really, su it's a super easy change, and I think it's really exciting, and it's, it got me excited to go to my first town meeting. So, you know, if I can be here, maybe other people can be here too, and other people can get excited about it. Thank you. Keep coming to town meeting. Gentleman on my left. Hi, uh, Richard Taft, 74 Brook Street. Um, I think what uh, the woman that started the conversation was trying to say is, is that we should have both uh, sexes identified in the, in the bylaw and not <clears throat> eliminate the sex in the bylaw. The other thing I think that's important to recognize, and I think a lot of people here do, at least some of the people that have been clapping, is that, strictly speaking, a question of pronouns isn't really what a lot of people are talking about. They're really talking about sex, in other words, the bio biology that we all believe is a man or a woman, and gender, which is the behaviors and traits that we associate with sex. And so, when we say, well, 
such and such person can easily be the chairperson or chairwoman or chairman of this. That's the gender identification. But there is a thought in the community that seems to be growing that <clears throat> we can eliminate the idea that most people uh, are biologically male or female. In fact, there is a very small percentage of people that are intersex, but it's not really what we're talking about. So we're trying to have this discussion about what we believe when it comes to sexuality, gender, or sex, and we're tying it up in this discussion of pronouns. And if that really is what the select board, select men and women are trying to do and want to do, then they should really say that. They should inform us, the people in this community, that that's what they're really trying to say. On the other hand, if they're just trying to correctly identify the sex of people who are capable of a particular job, they can do that as the, the, the woman suggested. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's any further discussion, Ms. Burbine. Ms. Burbine, you have a motion? Ann Burbine, 10 Pennycrest Road, I move the question. Motion that's been made is to move the question, which would terminate debate. Requires a two-thirds vote. There's no debate. I'm going to put the motion. This would be the motion to cut off debate and to take a vote on the main motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. I'm going to try it one more time. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. We don't know the motion. We don't know the motion. Is there confusion on what the motion is? The motion before the meeting, we'll do it one more time, is to cut off debate. After that, if the, if the meeting votes to cut off debate, there won't be any further debate. We'll go right to a vote on the main question on whether we change the bylaw. If the meeting votes not to cut off debate, then we can have more debate before we take a vote. So again, the motion is to cut off debate. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Uh, I don't think we achieved two thirds. Therefore, we'll go on with further discussion. Gentleman at the mic on the right. Thanks. I just felt the need to respond to our last uh, citizen's comment about what we believe. And I want to talk about what we believe in situate. My four-year-old son this summer, when we were playing with a bunch of little plastic army toys that his grandfather, my dad, had given to him, uh, who's a veteran. And uh, I was talking to my son. I said, make sure you pick up your army guys before you come inside. And admittedly, as a father, I am not good at talking about gender with my son. It's an area in which I need to grow and I need to learn more. So I know this didn't come from me, but he, he paused and he said, Dada, shouldn't we call them army people? Because girls can be in the army too. He's four and he gets this. Select men, speech and words affect how we think. How we think affects how we act. Select men is sending a very specific message about what we believe, whether or not we've thought about it to the women in our town, to the girls in our schools. It's a very simple change. We need to change this language and show the youth of Situate and the people of Situate what we believe. Thank you. <laughs> Lady in the center, Mike. Stephanie Burke, 93 Marion Road. Um, just a quick little thing is I remember when I was elected president of my school and up until that point I had only heard Mr. President, Mr. President until I began my first meeting and I was addressed as Madam President. And to hear that for the first time changed my world. And that was in eighth grade. And the more that we could come together and use this kind of language to promote inclusion, to promote opportunity, whether it be male, female, non-binary, whomever, is the more opportunity we are providing for our youth. And I think whenever we form these discussions moving forward, whether it's for a budget, whether it's for language, 
My primary concern always is for our youth and for our future. Now, if you can take this article from it and be concerned with language and sex and gender identity, it is not about the inclusiveness of this article. This is about, and purely about for some, the exclusion of people. And so we can look at something and we can worry about the positive effects that it will bring and the inclusion it will welcome, or we can continue to look at it in the eyes of exclusion, which is something our society and this town has done for far too long. So please, when you vote on this, Please look about how we're going to be moving forward instead of how we're going to continue to exclude people. Thank you. Gentleman on my left. Ty Halevi, 65 First Parish Road. Um, I, I was struck by the comment made earlier regarding uh, some uh, ulterior motives that are attached to this motion that somehow in seeking to neutralize the pronouns, there's some sort of larger design about eliminating sex or in notions like that. And it, it, it's an interesting proposition because it assumes that somehow we are not dealing with each other in good faith here as fellow citizens of Situate, which I find problematic and it, it, it kind of reeks of the sort of national politics leaking into this venue, which I find disappointing actually. But apart from that, what would be so wrong with removing sex where sex doesn't belong? I don't want to think about sex when I'm dealing with the board of with the select board. What's it have to do with that? When I'm dealing with a police officer, I don't care if it's a man or a woman. Sex has nothing to do with it. I just want someone to carry out the task. This, the fact that we've attached gendered pronouns to these offices in the first place is ridiculous. It's not necessary. Just like we don't say doctor man, right? A doctor is a doctor. We don't, we don't distinguish that. This simply makes the titles more fitting to the task at hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lady in the center. I'm Julie Burgess, 18 Tanglewood Drive. I'm not a professor. I don't know Shakespeare as well as other people. I'm a mom who has daughters. And to be honest, maybe I wasn't clear, but um, there are options for the title of the board. I don't see why there aren't options for the title of the board. My main issue is in the bylaws and all the written word to take out he and she is, is really diminishing and in, in unempowering. And as the speaker before, two before me said, it changed her life when she heard Madam. So I really feel like women should be recognized for all their hard work. My mother was a businesswoman on the South Shore for 25 years. Like I said, I'm raising daughters, and I want them to be empowered and see the word woman and she. As far as the title, I think the title could be worked with. And it, maybe there just has not been enough discussion, or maybe the town hasn't taken a close enough look at the bylaws to see how many, if you really truly were going to make that document gender neutral, it's more than he and she you're gonna to have to dive way deeper, and I think it's gonna take a lot more discussion. So I don't know if it should be tabled until more people in the town can weigh in and maybe discuss it further, because I don't think there's been a clear look at the actual bylaws. It's, this, this conversation's kind of um, circling around the title of the board, which I totally appreciate that gentleman's um, comment about the army men, I, I, I understand where his um, brilliant child was coming from, but I think we have to take a closer look at all the language, and it just feels like it's being rushed. And I actually have to say, my heart's breaking a little bit right now for Situate. I've lived here for a long time, my grandparents were here for a long time, and to say this town is excluding people breaks my heart. This is the most inclusive, beautiful town that I have ever lived in, and I've lived a lot of places. 
And it is not exclusive of people. It's actually the opposite. We are one of the most inclusive towns on the South Shore and possibly in Massachusetts. Lady to my right. Hi there, my name is Emily Matthews. I live at 158 Clapp Road. And I just want to speak directly to the pacing of this decision. For the record, I'll be 42 on Sunday. And my entire life, this has been select men. So at what point in my lifetime is it been long enough for you to make this change. I hope you do, thank you. Thank you. Lady in the center. Mary von Feynman, 124 Front Street. Um, I have no objection with this whole motion except for one word, they, because I found out recently it has a dual meeting. If you had chosen another word, I wouldn't have an objection to it. But now that I know that it means more, that it's going to put a connotation to ev everybody in the bylaws, it, it, it disturbs me and I, I feel that it should be substituted with something else. I don't know what else. But there's two meanings to it now. And it, ha and it has, if you asked me two weeks ago, I would say, that's okay, but it doesn't mean that to me now. I have a clear definition of um, the word they. And so, I, you know, I, I am for neutral pronouns, but I don't think they is a neutral pronoun. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote on this. This would be to change the references as suggested in the motion. This is, requires a majority vote to amend the bylaw. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. I declare it a majority vote. If a uh, seven person stand, we'll have a hand count. We have seven people standing, we'll have a count. Do we have the tellers? We don't count it's paper. Well, it'll be a standing count is what we will do. Standing and hands? Well, I'll have a standing. Okay. okay, the tellers in place. We got everybody. Okay, in order to vote, you have to be sitting, everyone's sitting. All right, I'm gonna ask all those in favor to stand. So, those in favor of amending the bylaw as put forth in the motion, please stand. And we'll have the count. Sure, you can vote. Hell is all set. All right, folks can sit. All those opposed to changing the bylaw as set forth in the motion, please stand. Tell us completed the count. Okay, we'll now take the count. We'll start. 
All right. Wait a minute, stop. All right, first we'll start with the right front bleachers. Mr. Maracci, how many yeas? Three. How many noes? Four. Next would be the right, right front area here. Eileen Murray. Uh, section here, right? Uh, Number of yes votes. Did you get the bleachers? I did this and this. Yep. Yep. Okay. So number of yes votes. Okay. Uh, yes votes for right front floor is eleven. You get that? No is four. And four no votes. And then right right front is yes three, no one. So Now we'll get the right rear bleacher. Keep going. So the right front floor is Linda Prime. We just got the right, did we get the right front floor? No, she got the, uh, the back floor, sorry. Right, we want to get the back floor. The back floor, is that yeah, the that's the Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, four, no, six. Okay, and the bleachers on my left. That, that's all was done together? Okay. Because of the spacing, we're doing this a little different in terms of our terminology. All right, so we're going to keep going around. Now we want to do the floor on my right side. Richard was doing the whole floor. How many yes and how many no? Yes, this is for everybody on the floor, including the um, uh, Board of Select People. Um, we have 20 yes. 20 yes. Two no. Two no. And we have the back bleachers left. Okay, the left front was three yes, one no, left rear, five yes, and that was it. There were no no's. Thank you. Got them all. Did we get the, uh, yeah, we got the advisory too. All right, we're going to tally those up. Okay, we have 49 in favor, 18 opposed. The motion carries. And last but not least, we'll move. You have a point of order? Yep. Point of order, Mr. Moderator. May I ask for a reconsideration of Article 11? Article 11. I, I can explain my, my logic. Um, Let me just get it in front of me first. Okay. The motion is reconsider. And I believe that's not a debatable motion. I, I could explain if it makes it easier. No. So, um, we have a motion to reconsider Article 11. Do we have a second? We have a second. Okay. Um, a motion to reconsider.
is debatable, so go ahead and describe uh, the basis of your motion to reconsider. Yeah, it took me a minute to process this article. I think you understand I was here to support the fire service, the Hummerock Fire Station number four, or the Situate Fire Station number four in Hummerock. Um, this article was well presented by Mr. Goodrich as a fiscally responsible article. Um, there was a motion um, to amend, and I think in processing that motion, it was actually consistent with the fire service, but I think it was um, related to CPC funds and was well explained that it couldn't be redirected. But I'd simply like to um, amend the article so that the sale of 9 Mitchell Avenue, which is the mine up fire station, be utilized to supplement and reduce the new situate fire station number four that was authorized today in Article 7 of this special town meeting. So in effect, we'd be splitting it so that the, these funds could be used to, um, to do what town meeting intended to do, which is to um, fund fire station number four. Okay. So we have a motion to reconsider. That's separate from what we might do if there is a reconsideration. So the first question is, do we want to go back and revisit all or part of the vote that has already been taken on Article 11? Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll take that for a vote. Um, because the Article Um, all right, this would require a two-thirds vote to reconsider. Again, the question is, do we go back and revisit it? Not an issue of what we do, if we do with it if we do. Simple question is, do we, do we reopen Article 11? So I'll call for a, a vote. This requires a majority vote. A two-thirds vote. Two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Uh, we do not have a two-thirds vote, therefore uh, we will not reconsider Article 11. If you want to count that, we can. Not seeing seven people standing, uh, we declare the vote a two-thirds vote. Next, now we move on to Article 16. I declared the vote. Move on to Article 16. Madam Chair, person. Article 16 is a citizen's petition regarding the funding of the South Shore Community Action Council. I do not believe, Mr. Moderator, that the petitioner is here. Is the petitioner here? Um, the Board of Selectmen uh, voted 0-5 against this measure, All right, well we, so I'm not inclined to make a motion, sir. We, first, we need to have a motion before we can discuss this. So is there a motion on Article 16? Mr. Gilmore. Um, I, I'd like to make the motion. I am aware of the petitioner and the circumstances the petitioner is going through with her personal home. So I will volunteer to make the motion to move this move this article forward. Yeah, if you want, want do you have an affirmative motion? I move to see if the town will vote to raise an, an appropriate or transfer from available funds the sum of five thousand dollars to South Shore Community Action Council. Excuse me, excuse me. You're, you're reading the article. Here's a copy of the affirmative motion. Oh. Thank you. We have to specify the funding. I move that the town appropriate the sum of $5,000 to South Shore Community Action Council, Inc., for services to low-income children, families, and elderly residents in the town of Situate, and to fund such appropriation transfer $5,000 from free cash. Have a motion. Do we have a second? Have a second. Motion is before the meeting. Mr. Gilmore, do you want to speak to the motion? Thank you. Um, you're, many of you are familiar with the South Shore Community Action Council. It was a um, federally created program in the 70s. It basically takes care of many of the communities on the South Shore. 
Situate benefits in excess of $100,000 worth of services provided uh, things like um, assisted heat, uh, food uh, scarcity protection of, 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 of uh, helping people that need food, uh, rental assistance for housing. Uh, we do, the town does, will tell you that they do pay for some of the services, but by no means does this town pay the volume of services that are rendered. The $5,000 is not going to make or break this commit this this uh, noble cause. It's a commitment to us telling them that we appreciate what they're doing. And they did not ask for funds last year. The year before they did ask for funds and a much greater majority of the town was here and voted in favor of it then. The uh, I'll speak, that's, that's, that's all I can say at this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, do we have a recommendation from the advisory committee? And let me have the advisory committee recommendation. Now in my capacity as advisory, um, the advisory committee deliberated on this and we voted in majority six, one and one. One abstained because he's a member of the South Shore Community Action Council. So that was the one abs abstention. So it was six in favor, one a no, and one an abs uh, abstention. Thank you. For the Board of Selectmen, Ms. Canfield. So the board recognizes the incredible work that this group does and supports and, um, uh, you know, it's very much... Um, benefit, the community benefits from this organization. The Board of Selectmen, however, felt that um, as we have so many very uh, worthwhile organizations that serve our community that are nonprofit, that this set a precedent that we would, it would be hard to say yes to this group and no to another group just as um, beneficial to our community. And we felt that it wasn't appropriate use of public funds to, um, to, um, to, to fund a nonprofit. Um, so it really has nothing to do with the benefit of this community, of the South Shore Community Action Council, which is not disputed. It has to do with setting a precedence on how we use our funds um, within the community. So our, um, the vote was zero five not to support, or five zero not to support. Thank you. Any further discussion? There being none, I call for a vote on this. This will be a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion to appropriate $5,000 to South Shore Community Action, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. Um, I'm going to do it one more time. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. I'm going to say it's a majority vote in favor and six people, seven people stand. We'll, we'll count that one. We don't have anyone standing. We declare it a majority vote. And that concludes our meeting. I'd move, uh, I'd Hereby declare that this meeting is dissolved. Thank you all for coming and participating. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the selection of the consent agenda people, huh?